Oh, okay, sorry about that. We can finally get started. Um, yeah, my name is Chen again, and in the next four hours, we are going to talk about practical AI. And today we have two simple prerequisites. You need to know the basics of deep learning. You need to know what is a neural network, what is gradients, and what is backpropagation, because we are not going to cover the theoretical part today. Just a simple knowledge is in enough. You don't need to have any practical experience because we are going to start early. Uh, sorry, start from the scratch to show how to do that end to end. And you need to know how to write Python. I don't think that's going to be a problem. And if you haven't, please go to collab.research.google.com to sign up Google Collab. We're going to run all today's demo there. And if you have a Jupyter Netbook set up, it's OK. Just maybe there is some development difference that might get the code broken. Uh, good. And you can find today's material in the GitHub, and we put all the links there. It's github.com slash and github slash scipy dash 2023 dash So let's talk about today's agenda. We have four small sessions today, and between each session, we'll have like 10 minutes break for people to take a break. And uh, in the first section, we're going to talk about Keras basics. What is Keras and why Keras and how to use Keras. And in the second and third session, we're going to talk about generative AI in computer vision uh, with Keras CV, which is one of our domain package. And you will learn how to use a stable diffusion, textual inversion, and prompt to prompt with a real code example. And in the last session, we are going to introduce Keras NLP and talk about how to do practical generative AI with that. And the main demo you will see is an instruction fine training to, to fine train a generative model with the Dolly, Databricks Dolly dataset. And at the end, we'll have time for question and answer. And also feel free to come to us during the break for any questions. We'll have just been staying here. Cool. Let's talk about, go to our first section. Uh, so in the next hour, I'm going to talk about Keras basics. Um, so we'll talk about our mission and how to run a model with Keras and how to try a model with Keras and talk a little about our design philosophies. So what is Keras and what is our mission? So Keras is a high-level API library built on top of the auto, differenti auto differentiation libraries. Before today, it just means TensorFlow, but after today, it means TensorFlow Torch and JAX. And in Keras, we offer consistent and simple APIs with backward compatibility on public APIs only. We don't ensure any backward compatibility on the private API. And we see that being broken for, a little, for sometimes. And our goal is to make the process of building and training your model easily. Um, cool. and a bit about our history. Keras was first out in 2015 in March. At that time, it was based on Theano. And in 2017, Keras added Keras support to its multi backend. And later on, Theano support was dropped because its popularity has decreased. And in 2020, Keras became the default high-level API for TensorFlow with TF2 release. And in 2022, Keras domain packages went live. And in 2023, actually today, we went multi backend again. A bit about our ecosystem. So we have modeling API in Keras for building a model and training API to help you train a model. And domain packages are designed specifically for domains, computer vision, and NLP. So uh, let's dive deep into Keras modeling API. The goal of having this API is to reduce the difficulty of defining a model. There are two important concepts. We're going to talk, look at them separately, Keras layer and Keras model. So what is Keras layer? Layer is the main building block for Keras models. You can view a model as a graph of nodes, and each node could be a Keras layer. The gist about layer is it has a list of trainable variables, like for example, fully connected layer has a kernel variable and a bias variable, and it, in a layer we define a forward pass logic. And the more complex version of it is layer wraps your common computation logic into a single class or object so that you can reuse it multiple times. There is no standard on which level you should wrap your code you can do any custom layers. Like for example, if you are familiar with the transformer model, each transformer layer has a multi-head intention followed by a layer norm, followed by two linear mapping plus activation. Oh, this is a transformer layer by the original paper attention is all you need. It has been changed a lot these days. And aside from the computation, 
Keras layer also does auto variable tracking and comes with supports on initializers for setting initial value constraints for limiting your layer variables in a certain range and regularizers to put some regularization on your, on your layer variables to avoid overfitting. And we have a bunch of common layers collected on the Keras.layers layers namespace, like dense layer for fully connected layer, also known as linear layer if you are more familiar with Torch. And COM2D is convolution layer for images. Batch normalization, just as it's literal, is for batch norm. Um, I've been talking too much. Let's look at the code, how to do that. So let's go to Google Colab. And the first step is to import the libraries. And let's use a simple case. Let's just load a dance layer. So layer. We just take one argument, which means your size of your output of your output. And let's define some dummy data. You can use tf or random or uniform or other ways to create the data. Let's put that simple as usually. This is the shape. And fit that in a layer. Oh, sorry. I good? Go. Sorry. <laughs> so with one important thing is all these layers are just callable. So you can just fit it to run a forward path like you are running a method, like you are calling a method. So the output is in the type called TF tensor. If you're not familiar with that, you can just view that as a NumPy array compatible with TensorFlow. And it comes with some attributes like shape, like D-type, and its value inside this NumPy array. And with this example, you see like our data is transformed from shape 3.3 to 3.2 because we do a fully connected, I will pass that into a fully connected layer. And you can give up, and this layer only maps the last dimension. So if you put input shape at 3.4.3, output will be 3.4.2. And you can do more, as we say, with the layer. Say you can pass an activation here, pass a ralu activation here. So if you're not, not familiar with what ralu means, that basically for every negative value is going to be mapped at zero, but for the positive value is going to be kept as it is. So let's re define a layer, and you'll see all the negative values have been mapped to zero. And you can put the, you can set initializers, kernel initializer equals to zero. By doing that, the output should just be all zero. And this is how you load a, div, uh, load a layer from our namespace. And it's also possible to custom your layer. You can do a layer customization, like if you don't, you are not, you, if your custom workflow has more requirements. You need to override three methods, in method for setting your attributes, and the build method to set up your layer variables, and the call method to set up your forward path. Let's see how we do that. So let's assume you don't like the name dance. You want linear because you are a Torch fan. So you're going to subclass class layers to layer, and the first method we need to override is init method. So init, and let's keep it simple. Let's just control like how the output shape. So we have the units argument. So self the units equals units. And the second method we need to override here is the build build method to add the layer variables. The build method always taking one argument, which is input shape, because sometimes, a lot of times, the layer variable shape depends on the input shape. There are two variables, if you still remember, the kernel, which is the matrix for linear mapping. And to add a variable, we use the add weight method coming from the carousel layer the layer class. You can also define any just like normal tier variables here, but add weight makes that easier for you. So we define a shape, which is going to be the input shape, last dimension, and the mapping to, to our units. Let's make that. And you need to define an initializer. Initializer. Let's use a convention, go route, uniform. 
And let's add the second variable, which is bias. So uh, it's just uh, the units. And initializer, let's use zeros. And now last we need to define the third method, which is the call method, to define the forward pass, which is same as towards forward, the forward method. And taking an input, just return matrix multiply inputs to the self dot kernel plus self dot bias. And let's instantiate this layer. It's called linear. And let's feed the data in there. Oh yeah, this is important. You need always to call a super in there here. And see, it's just similar as before with different initialized value. Okay, um, that's all about the layers. And we have layers right now, but we are not enough because we need the models eventually. And there are three ways to build a Keras model. And the three ways are called functional API, Fun uh, sorry, sequential API, functional API, and subclass in a model. We'll go look at them one by one, but in short, functional API is the best. Um, let's look at sequential API first. Oh, what is sequential API and when you should use that? Sequential API is suitable for models. If your model meet the criteria below, every layer has only one input and only one output and the output of each layer is only taken by one layer. This sounds a little confusing, but what that actually means is your model could be expressed in a sequential way, like layer followed by layer, no shortcut, no multiple inputs, like a basic, basic use case. Let's see how we build a model with this way. Let's assume today we are going to look at an image classification task. And we have two labels, also two classes. And we want to use a convolu conf network. And to build a, se let, let's build a sequential model here. So sequential model is our model's name. And we should use Keras or sequential API. And it takes a list as its argument. And you just stack your layers here. The first layer will be an input layer, defines the input shape. Let's assume we use 28, 28, 3, so like RGB image, and the input here doesn't include a batch size because batch could be dynamic along with the training. So let's add the first layer, layers, come to the, and let's say like output channel is two and the kernel size is two, and mm -hmm. let's add a max polling, oh. 2D with a pulling size as two as well. The model is like a dummy model, so what's inside that doesn't really make too much sense, but yeah. Uh, after this, because we are doing a classification, let's flatten our image data into like a batch size times feature size. So layers, flatten. And uh, last, we need to map that into our class var probability, so we put the dense as two, and here, the output is something we call the JITS, which is one step before the probability distribution. And for some reason, this is more robust. But in training, if you output the JITS instead of the probability distribution, which means you don't, if you don't have a softmax here, the training will be more reliable. I don't know why, but this is just a common practice. Uh, so uh, we have the model. Let's define a dummy data to fit that into our model. So here, the data still use a random data form. And let's say we have batch size of two, and in each example is of the same shape here. Let's fit that into our model. So the output will be for each image, we have, a, we have two outputs representing the logistics for each class. And if you, are, you wanted to see the probability distribution, you just need to fit that into our activations. So this is how you do that. And after the softmax, it's going to become the 
probability distribution, adding up the two values, you get one. Uh, make sense? And sequential model is easy to write, but it, it's not for all, because as we said, it has so many limitations. So to m the more powerful way is to use the functional API. It's basically like you are writing a function. This is a cool example for how to do that. We'll see the demo really soon. But basically, you define the inputs, and you feed that to your layers. And these are just symbolic tensor. There is no value inside that, but it just tells the model how we are going to connect these layers together. And after you define, after you use a symbolic tensor for the forward pass, you just need to cast a model uh, class uh, constructor to glue them together. And you can do basically anything with a functional model because it, it is suitable for building any directly acyclic graph of layers. And yeah, and this is how you do a multiple inputs. There, like you can define two inputs and feed that to a layer. And when you are creating the model instance, you can just put the, the input as a dictionary. Let's see how that works. So let's go back to a collab and let's replicate the model we built with a, a sequential API in a functional API way. So if you remember, we need to define symbolic inputs, which is going to be a class input layer. And now a shape is 23. And the first layer is comp layer. Let's just copy. Oh, that's an X equals to we fit that into a max pooling layer. And X equals to flatten. And outputs will be the output of a dense layer. And we need to glue them together to our model. We call that, let's call that functional model. Equals to keras model, inputs equals inputs, and outputs equals to outputs. Oh, sorry, <laughs> this should be inputs. You can fit the data there, and you just get the same thing as before. The value could be different, but like I'll be shape the same. And this is how to replicate in the model, in the functional model way. And let's talk about how to make a more complex case with a functional model. Let's say, for some reason, your model wants to take in two images. And you want to fit them separately into a convolution layer. And you want to add them together afterwards. So how to do that with a functional API? Let's still start from here. So now you have two inputs. So let's just do input one equals to this. And we also have input two equals to this. And here we just put x1, and this is input 1. Let's replicate that with input 2. And here we just put x1 and x2 together. Th this model makes basically nonsense, but just show how to do that with a functional API. And say, and the difference here is when we glue the model, glue up the model, we need to Call that just weird model. The inputs, you can use a dictionary or simply you can just use a list. So it can be input one, input two. Ah, it should be more consistent. Uh, and how do you call this model? You can pass a list here. As with our data is just a single image, let's use a list of data. And you see that works in this way. Like, yeah, this is just show, show you like. We can have multiple inputs, and each layer could take in, like say, this max pooling layer takes in two inputs there. And to make that clear, you can do the model summary to see what's going on here. So we have two input layers, and the convolution layer is connected to one. And there's add glue them together, and the max pooling will take in the input from, output from the add. And we flatten and output that to dance. And functional model could cover most cases, but some people are like to look for something different, especially, again, if you are a PyTorch fan. You want to write a customer model. So it's, it's also doable in Keras. You just need to subclass from the Keras model 
and define an inner method and a call method for forward pass. Uh, what time is it? Uh, I don't think we have enough time for this one. So like, I'll skip the code demo for this, but this is very simple actually. Mm. Okay, and uh, one small part is class models can be sliced. What does it mean? It means like if you have a, already have a model and you want just a part of the model, you can just take it from the middle. Like say in our example here, let's forget about the weird model. This, this, uh, so in this functional model, we have this 2D max pooling and you just want to stop after the max 2D here. And then you can truncate the model right here. So how to do that? Let's see. Hmm. So you can do, let's call it slice model equals two. You still, to do that, we still rely on the functional API. You just define the inputs as the functional model inputs. And outputs equals to functional model, okay, layer with the right identifier. To get that, you can just uh, do print out a summary here. And we all get the output of this. So get layer. Oh, by the way, like most of these code examples can be found in the GitHub link. If I'm typing too fast or too slow here, you can just check the code there. Uh, get layer, get output. Let's make that more readable. And we can print the slice the model structure by the summary call. You're seeing like we are stopping at the max polling here. We don't have the flattened layer and dense layer. Let's call model slicing. This is not super commonly used, but like sometimes you want that. And that's all about our modeling API and what's the best practice? The best practice is by default go with the functional model because that's clear on the graph and compatible with the summary and the model plotting. And for a simple use case, if you just want to test out, like if your data pipeline is fine or like some simple unit test, you can use sequential model because that's easier. Only use subclassing model when the above two do not fit or you prefer like that way. Like you want, to more, you want more control there. And that's about a modeling API. And it's not enough. Like because I, when you want to actually train your workflow any more than just a model, so what do we need? We need training data, and we need a model. We need to know how to perform a full forward pass, which means from the data all the way to a loss. And we need to have the backward pass, which is from the loss to compute the gradients and update, and use the gradients to update the model variables. And logging is just, yeah, you need, you need logging. Uh, and so to fulfill the gap, Keras offered the training API. Um, there are several things important about training API. The first thing is offers training components to fulfill the gap, and it has optimized, we have four important categories of components, optimizers, losses, matrix, and callbacks. We'll see the details in the next slide. And we provide two important entry points for training, model compile to configure your workflow and the fit to kick off your training. And, and our API is uh, compatible with TF data, but TF data is out of scope of today's topic. And if you're interested, you can check the doc here. Oh, we, we are going to share the slides after the talk. So don't worry if you will you you lose this. Let's talk about our training components. Uh, as we say, we have four important categories. The first one is loss. Basically, it guides the training. If you don't have a loss function, your model is just output things without any supervision. So we have commonly used the loss functions collected under the character losses namespace, like MSC mean squared error, like sparse categorical cross entropy useful for the multi-class classification. And the optimizers, our second important thing is optimizer. Basically, when you get the gradients, you need to how to apply them into your model variables. So come the optimizers. We, you can start, the simplest one is called SGD stochastic gradient optimizer. And you, we have most of like important things here, like Adam W is for NLP tasks. 
And these optimizers are extensible, so you can extend, extend that to your custom training flow. And matrix. Matrix is very similar. It's not similar, but corresponds to a loss. But it's written in a more meaningful way. Usually, if you see a loss like 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, it doesn't mean anything. But the matrix, you can tell the meaning there. Usually, that's just accuracy, recall, or F1 score, or something else, like blue score, root score. You can tell the, tell the meaning there. And callbacks is used for control your training workflow, like the some popular ones, like tensor, tensor board callback to plot the training, log your training into tensor board. And the next topic we have here is to how to configure your workflow. The important thing here is model.compile. It, it does multiple things like set optimizer, set a loss, set a matrix, and some other fields. But basically, you can view that as like we're just attaching all this missing part to our model. So let's see how we do that. Let's stick with the functional model, and let's see how we, com how we configure that. So functional model, just need a compile method an optimizer. Uh, let's define a loss first. If you remember, we are tackling a image classification here. So our loss will be a sparse categorical cross entropy. And we upper logistic here, so we need to make sure we set it from logistic equals to two. And optimizer, let's just use a simple atom optimizer with the learning rate as zero, zero, 001. And matrix equals two. Corresponding to the sparse categorical cross entropy, let's use a sparse categorical accuracy. That's, yes, that's basically all we need to compile the model. And we have two items here, run eagerly to compile. This is a bit complex and need some context. We'll jump back to that like in about like five minutes. So after configuration, we need to know how to, oh, where, are, where am I? So after configuration, we need to actually kick off the training. Uh, so that comes with the, probably I would say the most important API we provide is model fit. In short, you just need to provide your data into this API and tell that how many epochs you want to run. But under the hood, it's very, very complex. And it does multiple things, like convert your data into a tf.data.data set, and does the batching, shuffling, caching, and so on. And it's also traced to a computation graph with TF function, basically that means it is transfor transforming your Python code into a TensorFlow graph. And it also supports distributed training. There, are, if you look at code base, there are so many distributed training code there. It supports model GPU training, it supports TPU training, and so on. And also does validation after each, after, at the end of each epoch. Also run the training hooks via the callbacks, and they also log the training stats yeah, and more about that. So let's see how that works actually. So we don't have data, let's define some dummy data here. Call that trend data and TF or random the uniform. I say our data has in total six sixty four images and each of them is the shape here. Trend label equals two. Uh here we need the help from NumPy. We need to generate zero and one label. So, numpy, SMP. We need to convert to tensor and numpy dot random dot random with size equals to the number of images. And this is the data. And let's see how we write the fit call. Functional model of fit. So we need data. We just pass the trend data, trend label. And I would say we need to tell it how many epochs it needs to run. So epochs, let's say we only run two epochs, and we can batch it with batch size of four. It starts running, and it does the logging, and it runs through all the batches here. 
I'll hop here for a while if you're running the code on your side. And where the logs is uh, loss and also the matrix we set up there, this is been basically means how many images have been correctly classified. Cla classified. And this is a model of it. And I don't know about you, but the first time I'm seeing this API, I feel really weird, because this is just like magic box, and I don't really like magic box, so I was wondering if there's another way you can have more control over this. But at this time, this is the like best practice I follow, but like at the beginning, I think I need a custom training loop. So actually, we can do that. And let's write a custom training a custom training loop, and that's exactly what's happening. Not exactly, but basically what's happening inside the model of it. Let's see how we do that. We have the data, but like remember the first item we put here is we convert data into a TF data data set. This is not necessary, like theoretically, but we highly recommend doing so because it comes with many good features like batching, shuffling cache, and also faster. <laughs> So let's convert that into TF data set. So called trend DS equal TF data data set from tensor slices. And we have the trend data trend label. And after we do the conversion, let's batch it with batch size four. And we add a cache. And this is magic. Add a pretty fast auto tune here that makes your workflow faster. And, and we have the data. Let's, because now we cannot use the compile anymore. Let's define these components again and just copy it here. Let's call that loss function. We have the optimizer. And the matrix, we no, no, no longer need a list, we just have one matrix. So this is the training components definition. And now define, we need to define a forward pass. We can define, okay, before that, like, so let's see how the training, actual training loop works. So basically we need to tell you how many epochs you need to run. So for epoch, the range, num epochs. Let's say just run two epochs. And for each epoch, you need to iterate over the data set for data trend DS. And you pass that to something called trend step. And in this trend step, you are going to do the forward pass and backward pass. So let's see how we define this trend step. It takes in a data argument. The first thing is we need to unpack the data into X or Y, features and labels. And we need, let's, we have the data, let's call a model to get the model outputs. To do that, you need to make sure this happens on the gradient tape scope so that it could be correctly, correctly recorded by TensorFlow. And outputs equals to functional model x. And we have the outputs, we need to compute the loss. So we have loss equals loss function. Make sure to feed the golden value before the our model outputs. And we can compute the gradients by using tape.gradient. And this is happening outside the tape scope. So loss and the target, the, the target is the loss and the source is all the trainable variables and there is a magic attribute called trainable variables here. Functional model. And after we have the gradients, we need to pass that through the optimizer. Just use optimizer to apply gradients. And this is the magic part. You need to call the zip. You cannot put them as two arguments here. Uh, this is due to historical reason, which I don't know, actually. And gradients model, uh, functional model, trendable, variables. 
this is basically all. Uh, we have matrix here. Let's make sure we update the matrix. Update state y and outputs. Yeah, that's all about our chance time. So let's see how that's running through the constant training loop. And let's print out the matrix at the end of each epoch to see if it's actually being trained. So accuracy is matrix. You need to call the result method to, re to fetch the actual value. Let's don't print that so long. Let's put the, point, the flow number with three precision. So yeah, the, uh, the epoch is so few, so it doesn't make sense. Let's see. Yeah, you're seeing the matrix is increasing, which means the model is converging. So let's recap what's happening inside this clustering and loop, which is also mostly what's happening inside model fit, but it's more powerful there. So you need to have the data, and this step, the conversion happens inside model fit. And but here, like we just taking the data from data set and unpack it, and we make the model forward call inside the gradient tape. And we compute the loss inside the gradient tape, gradient tape as well. And outside the gradient tape, we compute the gradients, we apply the gradients, and we, up, we update the state matrix. That's the simplest custom channel loop. You can see here. And it's almost all the topics for the first section, but there are some important parts we are missing. Like one thing is there are two modes in TensorFlow. The first one is called graph mode. The second is called eager mode. If you have familiar with TF1, oh, actually, I, I wonder how many people here use TensorFlow 1. Have ever used TensorFlow 1? Oh, cool, not a lot. <laughs> well, so like TensorFlow 1 has been criticized a lot because you cannot check the outputs of a layer. Like this is due to it only supports a graph mode. And so what is graph mode? Uh, let's talk about eager mode first. So eager mode is running your TensorFlow code just like Python. As we have been showing in this demo, we can call a layer and just get its value, all this, and the model we can get the outputs. This is just called eager mode. Eager mode runs your TensorFlow function in the Python way. So every operation is executed line by line. And on the other side, graph mode is different. Graph mode compiles your, or say, I don't like the name, compile, but transform your TensorFlow code into something called a TensorFlow graph. And there, your code is no longer executed line by line. If you do the print, you cannot see the actual value inside that. And why do we need that? Because that's faster. That's the main motivation. Uh, in, a, in a real workflow, Eager mode could be five to 10x slower than graph mode. So our practice is usually debug with eager mode, make sure the pipeline runs. And after that, you just use gra graph mode. And how to switch between eager and graph mode? Let's go back to the custom channel loop, the trend step here. With a plan function, this is run in eager mode. If you want graph mode, you put the tf dot function annotation here. And let's see what's the difference here. Let's say if we want to print out the loss here, is that something? Let's loss. And let's see, okay, let's see in eager mode what's going to happen. You're going to see so many spam outputs. If you count the number of prints, it's going to be 16, which is number of our batches. But if you put that in the graph mode, it's going to be weird. You will see sometimes one, sometimes two. Losses are being printed, and you don't have any value here. But this is printed during the graph building time, not in your actual in execution time. So the practice is you should always debug with eager mode and run it with graph mode. And how to do that with model compile? It's very simple. You just need to have the run eagerly, set as true if you want eager mode. When your model has bugs, just add this flag, and that's all. And if you don't set anything, it's going to be by default running graph mode. And that's about the eager VS graph. And to save your 
To save a model, there are two ways. You can do the model dot save to save the whole graph. When do you need that? Like, if you want to switch between your platform, like you want to deploy a model to mobile device or to like for serving, you will want to serve, save the whole the whole computation graph by using model save. And if you want to just save a weights for maybe distribution, like a uh, means you want to share the model with someone else. Like if you have a pre-trained model, this is awesome. You want to share that in the open source, you can just use model save and save with uh, .h5 format. And if you want to save your checkpoints during training and you want to resume at some time, you can use the checkpoint callback. There is a code example I put in the GitHub repo. We don't have time, so you can check out code how to use the checkpoint callback there. And Okay, and the last slide for this section is about our design philosophy. And so in Kara, something important are like we make sure our arguments are concise and consistent. We try our best to avoid long arg list, which is bad. And we make sure our API name has the meaningful name. For example, max polling 2D, which means max polling on 2D spatial data and make sure we have meaningful name for the arg name too. Like in optimizer, we have argument learning rate, which is just a learning rate. And we ensure backward compatibility on public APIs. You can, you can expect that the same API will still work with your old Carasco, but like we don't have control on the TF side, so sometimes it's broken on there. And every symbol should have doc strings, which means you should always be expecting to find examples and what this symbol means in our documentation for Keras APIs. And we try to hide uh, the complexity under the hood, like distributed training support in the base class. And example is in the optimizer class, the base optimizer does all the tough things and the, the subclass optimizer only need to define the update step. And we make sure not make sure, but we try our best to raise actionable error message. Whenever you see an error there, you should be able to know what you should do. And we try to ship readable code and make our code extensible and modularized. I think that's all for the first session. So any questions? If not, we can go to the break. Wait. Cool, so I'll get started now. Um, so we went through the basics of Keras. So now we can try to understand what generative AI is. Uh, Gen AI is a kind of AI that creates new content based on what it has learned from existing content. So the process of learning from existing data is called training, and it results in the creation of a statistical model. And when given a prompt, the Gen AI uses this statistical model to predict what the expected response might be and generates new content. So uh, all machine learning systems make predictions, but not all of them are considered generative AI. And Gen AI is a subset of machine learning that is specifically designed to create new content. So if the output of the machine learning system is uh, limited to a specific set of values, then it's not considered generative AI. Like for example, if you're using an ML system to determine if your email is spam or not spam, then that is not considered Gen AI. Um, but if you have a model that is writing blog posts, news articles, or generating new images, so where the output of the system is not limited to any specific set of words, then that is, uh, any, any specific set of outputs, then that is called Gen AI. And few of the examples uh, for Gen AI is like DALI2, Stable Diffusion, which we'll go into more details today, and uh, GPT, et cetera. So this is kind of, uh, you know, Gen AI has a vast landscape and it has found its applications under many categories like text, image, code, video, 3D models, uh, multimedia, et cetera. And this is only going to get bigger and better going forward. 
Although the applications are vast, most of them are enabled through two preliminary uh, Gen AI models, that is uh, generative language models and generative image models. And we are going to learn about both of them and how to enable them using Keras in today's tutorials. So the language models learn about patterns in text, syntax, languages through their training data. So given some text, they predict what comes next through uh, inference. And this means that they can be used to generate text, poems, scripts, um, news blogs, musical pipelines, emails, letters, etc. And with image models, use diffusion methods, which we'll learn more about in this session, and techniques to create new images or image-based uh, media. So given some prompt or related imagery, they can transform random noise into images and generate images from those prompts. So Keras CV, we'll learn how to use Keras CV to kind of uh, use that for gen generating novel AI images. Uh, Keras CV is a library of modular computer vision oriented Keras components. So these components include like whatever Chen went through in the first session, the models, layers, metrics, callbacks, and utility functions. You can do a lot with Keras CV, but today we're going to explore how to use this library for creating generative image applications. And with Keras CV, you can create new images that are realistic and creative. So let's get started. Um, today we're learning more about stable diffusion. This is something that is available in Keras CV. Uh, it was launched in August 22 by a startup called Stability AI. It is a fully open source text to image model and it's generously licensed. It works similar to another model called DALI2, which was released by OpenAI, and more similar to another model called ImageGen, which is, both of them are not open, so it's just a stable diffusion. So what does this model do exactly? Um, here's an example. If you provide a prompt, something like Paradise Cosmic Beach, the model takes in this prompt and it outputs an image that looks something like a Paradise Cosmic Beach. And I have a few more examples to give you an idea of how these outputs might look like. Uh, here's a gentleman authored in a 19th century portrait, a cute magical flying dog, fantasy art drawn by Disney concept artists. Here's a pencil sketch of robots playing poker. It's, it kind of reminds you of that app called Lensa, where you generate your own portrait. We'll, we'll see how to do this today. So how does all of this work? So let's take a step back and look into that. So it's not, it's not magic, it's just a lot of data. And it's, it's kind of a latent diffusion model and let's dig into what the latent how the latent diffusion models work. Um, for that, let's try to understand what autoencoders are. So autoencoders are a type of artificial neural network that can learn to represent data in a lower dimensional space. They are typically used for dimensionality reduction, noise reduction, and image compression. So the autoencoders work by first encoding the input data into a lower dimensional representation. And this representation is then decoded back into the original data space. And the goal of the autoencoders is to learn a representation of the data that is as compact as possible while still being able to reconstruct the original data uh, accurately. So the latent representation is what you see the checkered box in, in the middle. It's the lower dimensional representation of the image that captures the most important information about the image. Our input image is like a handwritten digit. The encoder basically compresses that into the checkered box, which is a low dimensional representation. And the decoder takes that low dimensional representation and reconstructs it back into the original image. So what's a latent space? So the late, what we saw here in the middle, that's the latent representation. That's what we call the latent representation. And that's the lower dimensional representation of the input data learned by the encoder. Now, if you pick a point in the latent space and generate an image from it and visualize it, um, Here's an example for an autoencoder that was trained with handwritten digits. You can observe that the space is continuous. Uh, it's really an interpolation of all the data that it has learned. Most of the time it would be making things up. 
Here you can see there are some digits that was actually present in the original data set, like the zeros, the sevens. Uh, and in between them, you see that it's some made up digits that look like a handwritten digit that it was trained on. So the latent spaces are continuous. And latent space walking or latent space exploration is a technique of exploring the latent space of a generator model. It works by sampling a point in a latent space and then incrementally changing the latent representation. So this can be used to generate really cool animations where each sample point is fed to the encoder and stored as a frame in the final animation. So I have an example here. For a high quality representation, it produces uh, coherent looking animations and um, here's an example of a panda turning into a plane and like reverse. Um, I have an e another example here of a dog turning into a bowl of fruit. And we'll try out this today, how to do this. So here's another concept called super resolution. So it's possible to train a deep learning model to denoise an input image and thereby turn it into a high resolution version. So the deep learning model doesn't do this by magically recovering the information that is not that is mis missing from the no, uh, you know noisy low resolution input, but rather the model uses the training data distribution to hallucinate the visual details that would most likely be given given the input. So what happens when you push this idea of super resolution to the limit? So you may start asking, what if I run super resolution on pure noise? And you would see that the model would then denoise the noise and start hallucinating brand new images similar to its uh, training data set. By repeating the process multiple times, you, get, uh, you can turn a small patch of noise into an increasingly clearer and high resolution artificial picture and you can generate brand new images. The images that you see there are not real flowers. These are generated by the model based on all the training data set that it was trained on. So coming to stable diffusion, what is actually used in stable diffusion? So we saw latent diffusion. So now to go from latent diffusion to a text to image system, you're still missing one key feature, and that is the ability to control the generated visual content. And that is done via uh, keyword text prompts on the top left. Oh. Um, so this is done via conditioning, a classic deep learning technique, where, which consists of concat uh, concatenating a piece of noise patch uh, with a vector that represents a bit of text, and then training the model of the data set with the image caption pairs. So this gives rise to the stable diffusion architecture, and it consists of three parts, the autoencoder, the diffusion model, and the decoder. Uh, the autoencoder turns your uh, prompt into a latent vector. Uh, the diffusion model then repeatedly denoises a 64 cross 64 latent uh, uh, image patch, and the decoder finally turns the latent patch into a high resolution image. Uh, so what happens here is like the first text prompt gets projected into a latent vector um, and by the, by the text encoder. And then the text encoder is simply a frozen pre-trained language model. Then that prompt vector is concatenated to a random generated noise patch. Um, it, and once that is concatenated, it, it is passed through the diffusion model. And that is repeatedly denoised by the decoder over a series of uh, steps. The more steps you run, the more clearer and nicer your image will look. And the most common number of steps used is like 50 steps by default. And finally, the latent image is then sent through the decoder to properly render it in high resolution. Um, here's another a uh, concept that you might want to understand is the clip encoder. Uh, it's a neural network that's used to encode images onto a latent space. So the latent space is a lower dimensional representation of the image that captures the most important information about the image. And the clip encoder is trained on a data set of images and text, and it learns to associate images with 
with their corresponding text descriptions. So the clip encoder consists of two parts, the image encoder and uh, the text encoder. The image encoder is a convolutional neural network that takes an input image and outputs a latent representation of an image. And the text en encoder is a recurrent neural network that takes a te text description uh, and generates a latent representation of the text description. And the attention weights are used to weigh the important parts of um, of the latent representations of both image and text, and the attention weights are learned uh, during training. But for stable diffusion, like if you recall, oh, where is that? If we only need the text encoder. So that's that. Um, so everyone has access to the GitHub repo, I hope. So there's a paper if you want to read more about it, uh, also a KRCV guide to read more about it. Uh, we have linked the GitHub, the documentation for KRCV. Um, and there's a pr presentation collab. If you click on the link, I hope you can uh, open the collab, and then we can try to generate some AI images now. I also have the link here and a QR code. If you can scan it and open the link, you can do that as well. And once you all have the collab open, just give me a thumbs up, and then we can go over it together. Okay, thanks for the patience. Um, so yeah, we'll run the utility functions here. And here's how you call the Keras CV stable diffusion model. Oops. Yeah, uh, so Keras CV dot models dot stable diffusion, specify the image width, image height, and now you have instantiated the model. Uh, the next step is let's uh, give it a prompt and then try to see what image it's going to generate. So you use model dot text to image, whatever you want the image to be, and specify a batch size it's going to print that many images for you. We're going to use the utility function here to plot images. Uh, it's going to take a while for the first one because it's downloading the weights for the encoder, diffusion model, and decoder. So once that's done, it'll be faster after that. So the prog bar you're seeing, it's the number of diffusion steps it's running. It's set default to 50. You can change that uh, using another arg called num underscore steps and set it to whatever you want. The higher number you give, you get a more clearer image. My prompt was astronaut riding a horse. I have one image that looks like an astronaut riding a horse. Did anyone try any fun prompt? You could, yeah, get creative with the prompt. And if you would like, you can give a more descriptive prompt. It's uh, the, m yeah, so if you can give something like cute magical flying horse, fantasy art, more descriptions like high focus, high quality, elegant, digital painting. Um, yeah, the more descriptive you make it, you can see more fun images. So let's try a more complex prompt now. That's our magical flying horse. Um, so if you use stable diffusion with Keras CV, it comes with 
a few advantages and we can speed up the model execution using a few of the features that's available with Keras CV. Um, I'm going to show that to you right now. So if you, you can run a standard model with no uh, special features that I'm going to show you now, we can start the timer, execute the model, end the timer, and then see how long a standard model execution is going to take. Um, I'm generating a picture of a cute otter in a rainbow whirlpool holding shells. So let's do that. So a standard model takes 25 <coughs> seconds to execute. Um, and that is our picture that's generated. So you can speed up the model execution by using mixed precision. Uh, how you do that is just call keras mixed precision, dot set global policy, mixed float 16. And then you warm up your model. You could call that once. Um, and then we'll see how long the model execution is going to take. we have warmed up our model we are going to again check with the start end time and then we're going to run the model in between and then see how long uh, it takes with mixed precision enabled So it's it takes twenty five point six four. It didn't make a lot of difference here, but let's try with XLA compilation. It basically it, y this will accelerate your inference time. And how you do that is basically using when you instantiate your stable diffusion model, you you have to set JIT compile equals true, and that enables XLA execution. Um, so let's warm up the model and then see how long this takes. Are you on yes. Uh, <laughs> about yeah, yeah, that's going to take some time. But if you subscribe to Colab Pro, I, I think uh, we have. Yes. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can go to runtime, change runtime type.
So you can see with XLA compilation, it went from 25 seconds to generate an image to nine seconds to generate an image. So, and that's uh, the cool part about Keras TV is you can write your models, instantiate your models, and then you can accelerate them and you have that option to do that. So, um, as, so what you can now do is, up in the break or whatever, you can try enabling both mixed precision and then XLA compilation and then see if it runs faster for you. So we did speak about uh, the latent walkthrough, um, you know, walking through the latent space with stable diffusion. And you saw that cool animation of a panda turning into a plane and the dog turning into a bowl of fruit. Uh, we're going to try making that animation here. Um, so you need two prompts. One is like the beginning of your animation, what you want that to be. And the second prompt to be your end, where your animation ends. So my first prompt here is a watercolor painting of a golden retriever at the beach. That was the example that we saw. And my second prompt is a still life DSLR photo of a bowl of fruit. And interpolation steps is the number of steps in your animation as well. That's the number of interpolated encodings that get generated. So what you do is you have to generate the encoding for your prompt one and generate the encoding for your prompt two. Um, and you do that by using model.encode text. And then once you have the encoding for your two prompts, you are going to interpolate it. And you can do that by using space encoding one, encoding two, and then number of interpolation steps. So once we have the encoding, we will generate an, the images from those encoding. And how you do that is basically, I'm using a seed, so I get a consistent image here, um, and generate a noise pass that is same as your latent space. Um, and you will use model.generateImage, the interpolated embeddings that you, encodings that you just generated, specify the batch size as the number of interpolation steps that we went through. And diffusion noise is the random noise paths that you just generated. And you get a bunch of images that, get, that gets generated from your encoding. And we will export that as a GIF and see how that looks. And export as GIF is like a utility function that we added in the beginning. You can use that to generate the animation from the images that get generated. So that's painting of a dog turning into a ball of fruit. So <coughs> was um, anybody able to get till this one, this point? Okay. So my colleague generated like a really cool demo where it's, he uses the same concept to feed the model with uh, lyrics of a song and generate video content for the song, basically using the same concept. So right now we're using five interpolation steps and then we can see that it's not very smooth, the transition is not very smooth. But if you increase the number of interpolation steps, you're going to see that 
the transition between in the animation is more smooth and continuous and uh, as a break exercise here I encourage you to try it with higher number of steps but um, you might run into out of memory issues so once you generate your encodings you would need to batch them and then generate the images array and then feed that to export GIF and then see if you can generate um, a cool animation with higher interpolation steps. And I have another optional break task for you. We're, we're going to take a break now, and I would encourage you to give, give this a shot. Um, we tried with two prompts to go from the dog to the bowl of fruit. Um, how about you can try with four different prompts, and then try generating encodings for all of them, and interpolate between them generate the interpolated encodings and use the export GIF to kind of visualize your um, GIF with four different prompts. So that would be the break task if you'd like to work on it and generate some cool animation. So we can take a break for 15 minutes and yeah, please give it a try. And this generating a more smoother animation must be, would be easy, uh, just increasing the number of interpolation steps and then generating the GIF, so give that a shot. And we can come back after the break at, uh, at 10. So I guess we can get started with our third session today. Um, so in the previous session, we saw how to generate AI images with just a text prompt. And now in this uh, session, we are going to see how to make edits to the prompts that, to the images using our prompts. And uh, also we will learn how to teach our stable diffusion a new concept or a new object. Uh, so prompt to prompt is a method to modify the prompt to stable diffusion while keeping the image visually consistent. Uh, for example, after asking Stable Diffusion to uh, produce an image for a photo of a dog with sunglasses, you can edit that, remove the dog and say that I want to see a photo of a cat with sunglasses. It produces an image that is visually consistent with the previous image, but it just edits that part of the image. So here's a like, high level overview of how this works. Um, if you want to read more, you can read, go through the paper if you'd like. But basically how this works is you take your first prompt and then you generate the attention maps from your model. And then you take your second prompt and then generate the attention maps from your model. And then you compare the two sets of attention maps. And depending on the editing task that you are trying to perform, you can then adjust the attention maps. So the adjusted attention maps are then used to generate the edited images. And here are some examples of how uh, the attention maps might be adjusted. Uh, if you're swapping a word for, uh, from your prompt, you might adjust the attention maps to swap the word for the new uh, word. And if you're adding a new phrase to your prompt, uh, like for example, I say, I want a picture of dog with sunglasses, you want to add additional refinement to it, like I want a dog with a heart-shaped sunglasses, then you would focus, like uh, edit your attention maps to focus on the new word. And if you're performing attention reweighting, that is, uh, if you say I want a fluffy teddy bear, and then you want to emphasize on fluffy, then you can use attention reweighting where your attention maps are then given more weight to certain parts of the image. And let's see how to do this. So if you have the GitHub repo, let's open the prompt to prompt um, collab. I'm using a GPU runtime here. I'm using V100. Um, so at least I'm able to demo something. M you might have a slower runtime, but you can still try it out. Uh, also, please make sure that you are go to manage session, and if you have any other sessions of Colab open, just delete those sessions. 
so that you don't run into out of memory issues or slower run times just do that and does everyone have the collab up and running can you give me a thumbs up if you have that okay cool uh, so we are installing keras db there and let's run the imports that we need for this collab like tensorflow numpy hello matplotlib and we have some utility functions here for plotting images and this you can ignore this as well this is for reweighting the attention maps uh let's see how to generate uh, how to do prompt to prompt so to begin with let's generate an image of a photo of a chihuahua with sunglasses so for this we'll use stable diffusion like we saw in the previous slides image height image width and then we have the prompt photo of a chihuahua with sunglasses and then we're going to call that this is what we did exactly in the previous collab uh, let's see what image it's going to generate so that's our image of chihuahua wearing sunglasses it's pretty cute um, let's do a word swap and let's replace the sunglasses with goggles and for that you're going to use the model that you just instantiated stable diffusion model use prompt to prompt and provide your first prompt is whatever we generated and a prompt edit uh, we'll replace sunglasses with goggles and specify the method we are using for editing is replace that is we're replacing sunglasses with goggles and um, yeah we need to specify self attention steps and cross attention steps and what that basically means is at what point or what step from the start of your diffusion process do you want the self attention uh, maps to be replaced and same way uh, at what step from the start of the diffusion model do you want your cro cross attention maps to be uh, replaced with the one from the edited prompt so that's uh, it's a number from 0 to 1 and let's just say 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 here and unconditional guidance scale is basically how close you want your image to be to your um, prompt and the higher the number the closer it's supposed to be, but also it's more noisy. So the default value is 7.5. I think here we're using 8. So uh, uh, let's run this and then see what image it can generate. I'm going to use the plot images, a utility function, to view it. Uh, so you can see that it's the same dogs. Even the colors of the sunglass frames are similar, but the sunglasses are now goggles. So you can try your own custom editing, try to see, replace it with a dog or whatever you want. Um, so the second kind of prompt to prompt editing is phrase refinement, prompt refinement, that is. Um, we'll go from a photo of a chihuahua with sunglasses with a photo of chihuahua with a heart-shaped sunglasses. So let's try to execute that. So it's the same thing. You provide your original prompt, your prompt edit. Uh, important thing is to keep the seed the same. And uh, we'll specify the method as refine and keep everything else the same and then see the image it generates. So now we have Chihuahua with a heart shaped sunglasses. So it keeps everything else the same and really edits. So if you generate an image and you think, oh, I wish I could change something else. So this is a cool tool to do that. Um, the next thing we're going to try is attention reweighting. Uh, let's generate an image of a fluffy teddy bear and see how that looks. And then we'll try to make the teddy bear less fluffy and more fluffy um, using the tension reweighting. So that's our teddy bear. And how do we make it less fluffy is basically you define your a tuple of, okay, <coughs> fluffy, I'm going to downweight, downweight by providing that as minus five. 
and we will generate our attention weights that is we are going to change the weight for that word uh, this is a utility function defined at the beginning of the collab so you provide your prompt your prompt weights and uh, you do the same thing here calling the model prompt to prompt uh, your initial prompt is the same your edited prompt will be the same and the method we'll be using is reweight and you would keep everything else the same and then run this So we have a less fluffy teddy bear here uh, for comparison. Um, so I had, yeah, I had one more like task that I would like for you to try, try to make this teddy bear more fluffy. Or it, did, was anybody, anyone able to do a prompt to prompt edit for one image at least? Oh, what does it say? Oh, I think you are, is it an out of memory error? Did you delete the other sessions? Okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> How long is it taking for you? Oh, cool. So yeah, if you're able to get at least one thing running, I would encourage you to try something new, something uh, <coughs> that you can think of. Try rebating and see how that goes. I'm going to give like two minutes for you guys to try that out before moving to. Um, so if you wanted more fluffy, you would just increase that number from minus five to like some positive number, high positive number, you get a really much more fluffier teddy bear. Is there a limit to how much time it matters? The image might look really <laughs> weird. <laughs> you might get a very weird looking, even for 20, it looks like a halo in the end because <laughs> of <laughs> how fluffy it becomes, but yeah. Um, so I'm using that so that I have a consistent output, but uh, if you are doing editing and if you want to make sure that the first image you generated is same as the one you edit, it's recommended you use a C. So, yeah. Say you generate an image and then you see I want to edit that image, you can use the same. Like edit your custom image instead of a generated image. Well, well, say you take like a, a real image. Yeah, yeah. And then start modifying. Yes. So this is different. This is prompt to prompt where it and edits a generated image. But for editing your custom image, there's another uh, API in CareCV called In Painting, where you can provide your image and uh, a mask for where you want to edit things. Like for example, if you're sitting in an image and you want to remove yourself, just provide an arbitrary mask around that part. So you provide image, the mask, and then a prompt to say, uh, remove me or, or what my end picture needs to be. Just, and then it would edit your image without it, it looking more really realistic. Uh, it's called in painting, if it's in Okay. Uh, we can move, oh yeah, so even with 20, like I said, it's very fluffy and if the higher number you give, it's going to look more like a hill. Okay, so let's move on to the next um, exercise that we are doing and that's teaching stable diffusion new concepts.
and a lot of apps trending apps have been coming out of this concept and we'll learn how to do that today um, it's called textual inversion so you can teach a model new concept and you basically teach a model a new object and give it a name and uh, you provide text prompts like in this case they're calling that object an S star and you can provide prompts like an oil painting of an S star, app icon of an S star, emo sitting in the same pose as an S star. So basically the model learns this new object, this new token that you're trying to teach and then it'll it can generate custom images for you. So how do we do this is we collect three to five images of your object like for example your pet or your own pictures whatever you want to teach the model and you can add a special token to the model vocabulary like let's say I'm using my cat and I want to name it Tom uh, that would be my special token and then you construct an image caption data set and then we fine tune the text encoder uh, with our new data set so how do we do that we'll take a look uh, in the demo here. Also, there are links to the paper, the Keras CV guide, uh, you, if you want to take a look. Um, let's open the textual inversion demo. So let's delete other sessions and I'm using the GPU here so for this collab most of the code is already present because it's quite complex but um, yeah there's some setup so let's go ahead and run the setup and import the libraries here and we have utility functions to plot images and we are assembling the data set. You can ignore what's being done here and just run it as is, but I would like to quickly go through what they do. Uh, so the assemble image data set basically takes your images and then uh, pre-processes it for your uh, training. So that's done here. And for your prompt editing, we have to define our new placeholder token. You can call it anything you want. Um, feel free to use your custom name if you are training it with your pet you can use your pet's name whatever you want whatever you think is most appropriate for the object you're trying to train that will be that and we'll assemble our text data set which is prompts that will most accurately describe your images and then we assemble the data set together in this method here so oh did I run that? no way Go ahead and run. These functions. So here comes the fun part. If you want to try today's example with the uh, with custom for custom images, you can go ahead and do that. I'm using a bunch of cat doll images that looks like this. Uh, so I'm using those cat doll images and then appropriate prompts that describe the picture and uh, my token is my funny cat token that's my token so I will be using a bunch of prompts to describe it uh, from what you can see I have like five images and then a bunch of prompts so my assembled data set is basically going to replicate my images to match the length of my prompts and it's really important to have a very accurately descriptive prompt here Otherwise, your learning or your training will not be, uh, or the generated images might not be as good. Um, so I'm using a bunch of single cat doll images, and then I'm using a bunch of groups of cat dolls images here. And I have uh, edited the prompt to be accurate for this part. So the previous one just says a photo of the token clean close-up photo of the token, blah, blah, blah. And the second one says a group of, so that's what I mean by like more accurately describing prompts. So, okay, let's run that. It 
it's cool to try as it is but i would encourage you to use your uh, custom photos and then see if you can generate your own um um you know train your model with your own images it could be more fun um let's concatenate the data set here and we are adding a new token to the text encoder here so um right now we will assume most of the model is mathematically perfect the decoder the diffusion model most of the text encoder most of the embeddings we are only going to train the embeddings of the token that we are trying to teach the model so we will initialize a token with some with embeddings of something that's close to what we are training so we'll take the cats embedding token and then we'll initialize that uh, so now we have the embeddings for our new token, which is randomly initialized with the cat embeddings. And we will obtain the embeddings of the text encoder, and then we'll concatenate it with our new embeddings for the token. And then we will assign that uh, new embeddings that we just generated to the text encoder. So then we will download the weights for uh, the diffusion model for the text encoder will uh, we will not download the weights and then we'll copy the weights one by one and we'll make sure that we are not copying it for uh, the text encoder and okay This will be provided as an API soon. Um, it's just we can go through the code. So we, you can ignore most of the um, complex parts here. Um, so now we'll move on to training. We have to make sure that we set most of the train uh, model is not trainable. We'll set the text encoder as trainable, and we will make sure that most of the embeddings is frozen. We will not change the embeddings of anything else except for our new token. So that's what's done here. We're freezing the rest of the model except for the embeddings of the new token. Okay. Um, so let's confirm that the proper weights are set to trainable. So we see the diffusion model is not trainable, the decoder is not trainable, but we have the weights for our token that is set to trainable. So now moving on to, these are some utility functions. You can just uh, run them here. And now we define the stable diffusion fine tuner. So uh, to quickly go over this, first you will be taking your image and then generating latents for your image, uh, the object that you're training, and multiplying with a magic number it's based on the paper. Uh, generate your noise patch that is same as the shape of your latents, and uh, define your time steps. It's the number of steps, like I showed 50 steps of diffusion. So you just uh, define your time steps here, and based on uh, a random time step that's selected, you introduce noise to your image. Like, for example, if you are further along in your diffusion process, you introduce lesser noise. And if you are uh, way ahead in the diffusion process, in the initial steps, you introduce more noise. So that's what the noise, diff your, uh, noise scheduler does. And you have the hidden state of your token. That's the one that we just generated. Um, so basically, what the goal of the stable diffusion model here is to predict the noise and not the image. So basically, what it has to do is identify the noise and then remove the noise. So what we are doing here is introducing the noise and trying to see if the model is identifying the noise correctly. So from the noise predicted and the noise introduced, we are going to compare uh, or calculate the loss and then do the backprop and train the model. So when you train the model, most of the model is frozen. Nothing is getting um, uh, trained except for the embedding weights for our new token. And all of this code is just doing that. So we'll go ahead and run that. So 
if before training the model let's see what what the uh, model will generate given given a prompt for that token so yeah so this is before training it generates something like a cat so once you start training let's run this we have the noise scheduler nothing else here and then once you start training this is going to take a while i don't expect it to complete during the session um you can just hit run and then hopefully check sometime um so just running it for a few epochs will not result in any meaningful uh, images being generated so at least i would recommend at least 50 epochs to see uh, the model learning your new object uh, i'm going to hit run don't expect it to complete now but once the model is complete i did run the collab yesterday so i have the outputs here to show um, you can give prompt with just like how you would before with the stable diffusion model stable diffusion text to image and then give a prompt like gandalf as whatever token that we trained it on minus my funny cat token fantasy art drawn by disney concept artist blah 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 a lot of descriptive prompt here and then this is the images that was generated by the model kind of looks like uh, this is a cat doll like as Gandalf so this is most of the apps that you see these days where they generate custom images for you um, so yeah once you have that down give it give it a try and then see how that goes Training is gonna take some time, so I'll just um, we can we can take a break while you try it out and come back maybe like ten forty five. I hope you found this interesting, and I really hope you try it with your own images and then see can do something cool. Uh, okay, cool. Let's get started. Thank you so much for sticking with us for so long, and it's Tariano. And in the last section, we are going to talk about Keras NLP and how to use Keras NLP for practical AI, for practical generative AI. So we're going to talk about what is Keras NLP and our mission, and talking about our offerings. And uh, last, we'll show how to do instruction fine training on a GPT-2 model with the Databricks Story 2 dataset which is the instruction fine tuning data set. So a bit about our history and mission. So we made a Keras NLP project to make that easy to build your Keras, build your NLP workflows to stack your model, also to train our model. In 2021, the project was started and we did our first release in 2022, the March. And at the end of that year, we finalized our pre-trained model API and did a release. And this year in May, we, final, we released our generative model APIs. And we also did a mobile integration powered by TensorFlow Lite and deployed a GPT model on a Pixel device. That was talked in Google I.O. this year. And as today, we released Keras NLP 0.6, which is able to, which is compatible, compatible with multi backend Keras. You can use the, like, the pre trained model in three backends without changing the code. And we'll show that in the demo later. So the first important offering about Keras NLP is, is its building blocks. There are four categories here, the layers, which are just the normal Keras layers as we talked in the first section, but they are designed specifically for NLP usages, like transformer layers, positional embedding layers, and so on. And the second thing is called tokenizer and preprocessor. This is a little bit complex. We'll jump into more details in the next slide. But basically, they use the to transform your text input into a sequence of integers and do some special padding and so. And the third offering is called Samplus, which is only useful for generating model. And to understand that, basically, you can think like for generative, when you are doing text to generation, you have the context, and you want to find the next token. And what the model gives you is a probability distribution 
over all the candidate tokens, and the sampler is there to pick up the right token. It's not just based on, it's not always using greedy. Sometimes it has some randomness, sometimes it's doing even more than that. We'll see how we use that later. And the matrix, nothing special, just some matrix for LP usages, like rouge score and the blue score. Let's talk a bit about tokenizer and preprocessor. This is a complex part. And basically, in Keras LP, we separate the term tokenizer and preprocessor. What a tokenizer does is simply transform your text input into a sequence of int IDs. Which means, like, if I have a string, I want, to, I want that to be a sequence of IDs to be able to be understood by a model. You use a tokenizer. There is no padding. There is no special token added when you're calling a tokenizer. All these are done in the preprocessor. So preprocessor is built on top of the tokenizer. Has, every processor has a tokenizer attribute. And after tokenization, has uh, extra tokens, like star token, and token uh, surrounding the text. And it also does the padding if your input has different size and produces some other fields like padding mask so that can be taken by the model. Let's take a look at, oh yeah, and to load a tokenizer or preprocessor, you can train, well, train that from scratch, but usually we just load that from the model. Say in the example, you're seeing where I load the GPT-2 tokenizer, we use a from preset method, it's a static method, and with the identifier. A bit about why we don't call that from pre-trained, just like Hagen Face did. Because here in our in our repo, the identifier has both the information for how we get that, get the model, like the data set with English data set or modern multilingual, and also the structure or the model size. Like for example, you can load a bird small English uncased and a bird tiny English uncased with the same class. Let's take a look at the code. So let's start with a new, new collab, and you need to install the Keras LP. And let's load a GPT-2 tokenizer. Let's let it just help. Yeah, I have opened this before, so that finished quickly than people, so but it's okay. So Keras, oh, sorry. Just pip install cars, that's an RP. And you want to import cars on RP and load GPT tokenizer, cars on RP, the models, GPT2. Let's see this. Causal from preset, GPT2 base, English. It's going to download the tokenizer, and we can just feed a random string there. Let's say, say welcome presenters. Oh, sorry, this should be, sorry, this is my tokenizer. And you're seeing this is being transformed into a sequence of integers. And it doesn't do any padding to check it out if we, our input has two sentences. This is just a testing stream. Not closed. And the output will be a list of list of different sizes. And Let's see what happens with the preprocessor. So let's load the preprocessor. Just see. Copy the models. Oh, all this code can be found in the in the GitHub, like in the last section. CB2. Uh, preset. Base. Pass the same thing into the preprocessor. We're seeing the output being a little different because the preprocessor, as we said before, produces multiple outputs. Like, aside from the token IDs, it also pro produces padding mask so that 
the model will know which position is the mask position. And it also pad, pad that to the equal length. Well, can take, so you see these tra trailing zeros, these are padding tokens, and these places will be masked. False means these are mask positions. And there are two ways to apply a preprocessor. The first way is to use that with your TF data pipeline if you want to do this before model call. The second way is to let the model fit handle work automatically. So basically, every Keras NLP pre trained models comes with a default preprocessor. So if you don't do anything there, it will just transform your text under the hood. Let's see how to do that with the TF data pipeline with, it, with the code. So let's create some dummy data. Yeah, uh, data equals to, let's just do this. And let's transform that into a TF data set. And let's apply the GPT-2 preprocessor on the data set. All I need to do is to use ds dot map pass it here. Oh, I forgot to import TensorFlow. And we print out the examples here. Let's do next. This is like we have, this is how we transform doing a preprocessor within the TF data pipeline. Okay, that's about our preprocessor, and let's talk about pre trained models. So, Keras NLP, what is pre trained model? Basically, it has two things the architecture and the pre trained weights. The architecture means how many layers there and what are these layers in your model, and pre trained weights are just like checkpoints we saved through the pre training. And there are two important concepts in Keras NLP pre trained models backbone and task model. What is a backbone? Backbone is what people usually call as models. Most of the cases, you can view that as a feature extractor. It often starts with an embedding layer that maps a sequence of ID to a sequence of vectors and end with a feature representation for each token. And task model is built on top of the backbone and applies to specific tasks, like text generation or text classification. Usually, task model just has some extra layers or computation on top of a backbone. For example, bird classifier, the bird model for text classification, is basically a bird backbone plus a dense layer that only takes in the feature representation for a special CLS token added to the beginning of your text and map that into the probability distribution. Depends on how many classes you have. And there are two ways for instantiating a backbone or task models. And if you want the pre trained weights, which is mostly the case, you, you can use the from preset method, like what we show from with the preprocessor and tokenized examples. And if you want to randomly initialize the backbone and task model, you can just use the Python constructor. It will give you a randomly initialized one, which I don't see often used, but if you want to kick off your pre-training from scratch, you can use this. And generating model, which is our main target today, is just a special type of task model. And it comes with the name, like GPT-2 causal LM. Basically, everyone, every of this model comes with a suffix causal LM, and they're based on the corresponding backbone, like GPT-2 causal LM is based on GPT-2 backbone, and it has an important public method called generate, which takes in your prompt and makes a generation. And under the hood, this is important, GPT-2 causal LM is still a Keras model, as we show in the first section, so you can just run fine training directly on that. And let's see that with the real code. 
So let's load a GPT-2 LM and see what it is. So GPT-2 has our, has our P models. Oh. And I will use GP, oh, I forgot this. Okay, so for the rest of the examples with a GPU, we need a GPU, otherwise it's going to run really slowly. Going to be a little But the code, we can just write code here. Like so, tb2 calls on from preset. tb2 base English. After this is finished. Uh, so. Uh, while it's installing the dependency, we can take a closer look into the breakdown of these task models and the backbone model. So here, we load the GPT-2 causal LM. It is based on two things, GPT-2 backbone, which does the feature extraction, and also a GPT-2 causal LM preprocessor, which is uh, just map your text data into the format that can be taken by this causal LM. And the preprocessor is based on a tokenizer, and all of this has a from preset study method. It's downloading our GPT-2 model. Only finish in a second. So here, if you, you look at the file, the first two files are for the tokenizers, and the last file is the model checkpoint. And let's take a look at the summary. So you can see this model has a preprocessor here, and the vocabulary size is 5257, and for the model structure, it, uh, the input has a padding mask and token ID, Fit fed into a GPT-2 backbone, and the reverse embedding is basically just a mapping from uh, your feature to the vocab. Like, as we said before, it's, the output is the probability distribution over the vocab tokens. So, with the GPT-2 LM, we can do a generate. To, uh, generate like say y is python good and let's limit that to be at most 100 tokens it will take a while like if you don't have a gpu with a gpu the first pass will be slow because it's if you remember what is graph mode it's going to trace the graph so the first call will be much slower than the following calls Okay, let's see the output. So, uh, that seems to be fine. Yeah, it seems to be fine. Like, <laughs> but I will see later with fine twin, this could be better. Uh, that's a, and we talked about samplers before, and here is how you can change that to use a different sampler. So, with the tb 2 lm this compile method, you can change the sampler. By default, it's using top P, or by default, it's using top K. So let's see what it does with a greedy search. And instead of a, uh, okay, so it's coming. Uh, yeah, with greedy search, you mostly you will see it's being replicated itself, and it doesn't know how to carry on because it has no randomness. It always picks up the the vocabulary has the max probability. 
You can also use directly instantiating a sampler instance here, like class NLP, samplers. Let's use a top P, sampler. And the P says 0 0.5. So what does this top P sampler does is it ranks your probability distribution from highest to lowest, and it does summing over the first uh, several things. Once it feels like, okay, the sum is over the threshold we set here, we stop there, and we only pick the token from the select ones. Okay, so you can see with the top P, the generation is much better than a greedy. It avoids duplication, I think. And we have covered this, covered this. Yes, in the next uh, 10 or 20 minutes, we're going to show how you can actually fine tune a generative model with a recently popular instruction fine tuning um, with the Dolly data set. But basically, as we say, like Keras OP models or call this custom models are still Keras models. So we can still use the compile and the fit method to just train that thing. And today we are not going to cover the reinforcement learning part, which has been popular since the GPT, chat GPT comes out. And we are showing, reverse, showing the other way. Okay, so let's get started. Today we are going to use the data set here, it's called DataBricks Dolly 15K, which is manually created instruction fine-tuning data set, and let's take a, oh. and for each data record has four fields, instruction, basically it's a question, and the context is an optional field, if there is a context, then the response will say the answer should be from, based on the context, no, it's just based on the knowledge it has already learned. And the response is just the answer to the instruction. And the category, we're not going to use that. They are just there for like data collection. Okay. And this is a cognitive data set, so let's install the dependency first. Pip install data sets. And we need the mask method called load data set here. And this code can also be found in the code line. It's a little long, so if you just want to execute there, it's, it should be easy. And let's load the asset. It's called Dolly. Take a look at an example. Oh, wait. oh forgot to set a split. Yeah, you'll see like this is an example of the data as shown in the spreadsheet. Basically it has instruction and a context and the response and the category. And it has four fields, but like for the, okay, a bit about how we fine tune a generated model. The fine tuning technique is called causal LM learning. It's a weird name, but basically what it does is given the previous text, I want to pre predict the next token. And I want to run this for the whole text I have here. And so technically, we don't want four inputs to the model, we just want one. So to group, group these four fields together, we need to provide a template. And I'll just copy it from the collab here. And this template is from Stanford Alpaca project. It's an open source project to find for fine training ALRM based on ChatGPT generated data. Generated data. If you're interested, we'll post the rele relevant materials in the GitHub later. And let's transform the Dolly dataset into the prompt template. So let's define the list here. So I call that full text. And we need to define a function for transformation. It's called a format. Take in the data. And there are two kinds of inputs. If it has a context, if it doesn't. So if the length data context, 
0, 0. We are formatting that with the prompt and no input. Full text. Pend. No input. We call it format. And pass in the two fields here. We leave some magic string here, like input and the response. We just will feed them there. So, input equals to data instruction. And we set the response. Data. Let's do the similar thing for the if the text has input has the context. So here we need one more field which is context. context. Oh, it's called input. And we need to run this through our data set. And let's take a look at a sample data after pre-processing. Doesn't seem to be working. Uh, This should be formatted. Yeah, this is what we need for our training. And the rest is, is super simple. We just need to do a compile to configure a training workflow and call a model of it. So let's, we are going to fine tune the GPT-2 model. So let's set the optimizer and the source function and the matrix. And here are a little special which is a common practice when you are using the, when you are doing NLP tasks, we need a decay learning rate instead of a constant learning rate. It's just common approach. And so here we need a learning rate to be a learning rate schedule which decrease. Um, okay, and let's convert the data set into a TF data set. data concept from tensor slices. Let's next. Now let's do the batching. Batch, let's do four. And as usual, we'll do the cache and put a magic from prefetch. TF data of the twin. Uh, num epochs. Let's just run two epochs. Okay. Um, if you look at uh, your, your full text Sorry, could you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good call. call. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and uh, let's run the following. So we define the learning rate as a decay learning rate here, and we run in total of two epochs. And let's define, let's do the model compile. So TBD2, um, Go compile. The last function as like the causal LM under the hood is still a multi 
class classification task. The like input is your previous tokens, and the output will be the probability distribution, and you want that to be close to the actual next token. So this last function will still be the sparse categorical cross entropy. This Set up from logits equals to two. And optimizer, so C equals, let's use a Adam W optimizer. So how R and weight K is 0 0.01. And the matrix we use to track in the training is the sparse categorical accuracy. We don't have cars. This is for compiling the model. Now we can just kick off the training, which is as simple as GB2 LM dot fit. It's called Dolly TF data. And let's set epochs equals to num epochs. Running through the whole data set will take a while, so we can just use a sample data here, like we only train on 100, the first 100 samples here. Let's see what happens. The starting will be a bit slow because it's compiling the TensorFlow graph. And if you don't have a GPU, the starting time will be faster, but like for each epoch, it will take much longer. So for instruction fine training, usually, personally, I just use three. And yeah. And, you, the, and the magic here is there is a recent paper coming out from Facebook or uh, Meta uh, saying their theory is all the learning power or what has been learned is already in your pre trained model. So what this instruction fine training is doing is to align your output to be, more cl to be closer to the human writings. So it doesn't really matter how many, like how, how large your fine tuned data set is. It's just like, hmm. just make sure that's closer to like human writing. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> it's going to run for another three minutes. And uh, while it's running, we can cover the, we can talk about our small things. Like, Keras OP model supports data parallel, parallelism. If you have multi GPUs or you want to use a TPU, you can wrap our training workflow with something called TF distribute strategy. In the code snippet here, if you have multiple GPUs, you can initialize the mirror strategy and just put your definition under the strategy scope and it will automatically detect your accelerators and put your data parallelly into these accelerators. And the model parallelism is also supportive, but it's more complex. And if you're just using a class RP pre model, it's easier, you just need to define the mesh which tells like how it's going to be distributed. And define your model on the, the layout map. But if you are not using a pre trained model from Carlos RP, it would be a bit harder in TensorFlow. And this is something we are actively looking into to get more aligned with the, with the current time. Like we are trying to add more LRMs into our collections, like Pythia, Falcon. We are working on that. We have PR opens. And we also added a LoRa fine training guide with the cars on P, we are working on finalizing that as an API.
uh, a bit about what is LoRa fine tuning, if you don't know. It's basically a technique used to fine tune the large LLMs like GPT-3, GPT-4. It's too big to be fine tuning, fine tuned with a normal technique as we are doing right here. So it grabs, it basically inserts a, inserts a bunch of dense layer into the middle of the model structure and you only fine tune these dense layers and you finally map them back to the LLM. And for more context, you can look at the guide here. We put a link in the GitHub as well. And we also did a own device deployment and and talk about that in, oh yeah, I don't want to play the video. But like, if you're interested in how to deploy your model into a mobile device, you can check the YouTube video here. Okay, that's mainly about the topic. Now let's see how it goes with our fine tuning. Almost there. So why is Ronnie any questions? Let's see the generated text quality after the fine tuning. So use wise typing good. Hmm. It's trying to finish up. Okay. I don't really know if this is better than before, but I think so. Like, why is Python good? Python has a powerful API that provides powerful and efficient tools to build a, a much complex web application. Okay, this is weird. But <laughs> this is more like, <laughs> like <it's, laughs> I mean, the quality is weird because it's GPT-2, it doesn't do much. But like, we can see the writing style, like is more, is closer to a human. Like, this is the power of instruction fine training, but yeah, web app applications now. Mm, let's take a look at before what we have. This is what we have before with Grady search, just replication. And this is before with top pay. Small language. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, but yeah, like. <laughs> so, like, basically, the theory is with instruction fine training, your app will be. Uh, more real, like, and we're closer to humans writing. And that's actually all about today's topic, but we have plenty of time. I want to show how to load the multi backend cameras to do the same thing, but like with a different backend. So, Torch and Jax, which one people want? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, we need to delay a bunch of things. Let's delay the runtime and restart. So the magic here is if you are on Colab, the thing you need to do is to set your environment variable to point that to the multi-bag and caras. Import OS and OS environ. Set a thing called caras backend. It goes to JAX. Then that's all we need. And it's going to automatically load the JAX in both caras and caras. It's called caras core, actually. We have a different name, caras core and caras RP. Sorry. 
This will take like a minute. Okay, so how many people here actually know what is JAX? Raise your hand if you know JAX. Okay, right. So <laughs> JAX is a also a deep learning framework made by Google, but it's mostly used internally. And it's more, okay, it's, more, it's favored by researchers in Google. And uh, for LLM integration, JAX has, uh, is doing very well. And yeah, it's, you can view that as alternative to TensorFlow and PyTorch, basically. And, oh yeah, and the one great thing about JAX is it's more like it's just using NumPy. Okay, so let's set that. Let's load the cast on P. It will print a login saying which backend it is being used in the model backend Keras. Here it is JAX. And to prove we are actually using JAX, let me think, see what we can do. Hmm. So the good thing about model bug and Keras is you can use that with model compile, model fit. You can also write the vanilla training loop there. Like if you load a torch, if you want to use torch with model bug and Keras, you can load a model, you can write a model in Keras, but you can still use the torch optimizer or Keras optimizer and to, to write a custom training loop with torch. You can still do optimize dot no grad, or zero grad, and dot, I forgot, like dot one. But like, yeah, you can use both fit and the custom channel loop. So, let me see how to show this is in JAX. Uh, Hopefully we should see some Jax login. No login. <laughs> Here's a way. So if we use the TBD2 LM to predict a random string. So since this is JAX, the output is no longer a TF tensor, output's a NumPy array. If this is using TensorFlow backend, output will be in the format of TF.tensor. So hopefully this is a solid proof to people, saying, seeing this is using JAX. And as usual, we can just do the same fine tuning process here. Let's run the following work. This is because we are not we should so the you know you know if you are using model by Keras, you shouldn't load the cars from TensorFlow anymore. Instead you should do import Keras core as Keras. Because we don't want a name conflict, so we are taking the name Keras core. We are going to make migrate to this new library. I don't know when, but it's going to happen in the future. So see how the field works. Yeah, 
some is starting. Hmm. Oh, there's something wrong with the learner schedule. Okay. Oh, here we have to use the TF. So. Hopefully this works. And this is our last demo today. Oh, it's just I accidentally put the TF here. Like, it has been a habit for me to use TF Alcaraz, but we shouldn't do that anymore. Yes, Keras is Keras core. The Keras Core is a new Keras library that supports model backend, which is totally a separate project from the current TF Keras. So, Keras Core. Oh, that's a private. It should be public right now, but this is our new repo, Keras Core. It supports model backend Keras, and the old Keras was. Yes, this was old. This is the old Keras. Now it's an old one. Yeah, it's on OM because Jax has a different way to manage the memory. Uh, This um, okay. I'm sorry, this is my first time trying this workflow actually. Just as you see.
Any questions about Monobyte Concaras, why it's running? Uh, we're in the beta release and we're targeting a full launch, official launch, not official, but full launch in probably September or October. And now we can try it out, it's very simple, just switch your from TensorFlow import Keras to import Keras core as Keras. Yeah, it's running fine. <laughs> and from the benchmarking, what I have noticed is JAX could be a bit faster than TensorFlow and Torch is slower and intense. Yeah, we don't need this to finish, but like, you can see like, even after we switch to Jax backend, the training is the same as you were seeing in the TensorFlow backend. Still prints, the same, prints out the same thing, and the API you're using is the same, compile and fit. And that's something we want to bring with our new characters. And that's pretty much all for today. Yeah. And yeah, that's all, all about today. And we'll stay here for a while for any questions you, you want, if you want to ask, but that's all. Feel free. Thank you.